Welcome back, Rabbi Dr. Eliezer Brutt. What a pleasure and a schos to have you joining to discuss the Aruch Lener. Many people have heard about the Aruch Lener and his work, the Aruch Lener. His Shubh is Ben Yantin. We're going to discuss some other works as well. We just completed 10 episodes on Efraim Tanayevsky. Let's call that season one complete. We'll take a break and Amir Sashem come back with season two. If you haven't yet seen the videos on the Chalitza Shoe by Rabbi Avram Wright, who wrote this contrast, please check them out on all that. Three beautiful videos discussing the Chalitza Shoe and actually showing us how to construct the Chalitza Shoe. Pretty fascinating. So, Rabbi, Rabbi, I call you Rabbi. Rabbi Brat, how are you today? Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Okay, so we're looking forward to an exciting episode on the Aruch Lener, who the Aruch Lener was, what did he write, who were his Rabbeim, who were his Talmidim, and I'm sure you'll treat us to something that maybe, maybe, there might be something that some of us don't know. So, why don't you begin? Okay. So to begin, my as an introduction, my interest sparked with him is I always noticed in always hearing the tremendous respect people always had for his farm, and in the world of halacha, the truth is binyan seeing how it's so it's quoted with great respect also. So I was always curious about him, and recently, actually through an old off, we gave a series about the machine matzah controversy. While um, going through the history of the machine matzah controversy, it came up that certain G'daylim and Galicia were sounded like not so positive about G'daylim and Ashkenaz at the same time, who were make about machine matzah. And they don't say names so much. I was curious, who were the G'daylim that they were referring to? And then I find out, at least one of them is the Archoner. Very strange, because at that point, I never really heard that people had Tainus on him. But anyway, Ty... And then now we start. Now we're learning Yavamas. It's about to come to the end. I said, you know, perfect excuse to talk all about Aruch Lener. Okay. So just before we begin, just to drop a bibliography, what's there out there, which helped me with this presentation. So first, in 1903, I think it's Rabbi Cheskel Dukas is Ayva Lemaishav. He wrote a book all about the Rabbanim of the of the the city of uh, Altoona and other other cities with the, the Rabbanim, and he has the first few pages, he has a few pages about Darch and now the most prolific um, amount of material, I guess the largest study about Darch to date is by Rabbits and Judith Bleich. She's the, she is the wife of Rabbi J.D. Bleich. She wrote her doctorate, completed in 1974, all about Aruch Lener, Mamish in depth, incredible, incredible doctorate. Unfortunately, not unfortunately, but just a lot of stuff have come to light ever since then. It's been a long time, since 1974. Most notably is a Yid, Rabbi Yehuda Horowitz, who's been working, unbelievable work on the Aruch Lener. He put out the Chuvis, but he's also put out many other stuff, some of which also helped me throughout the presentation. Um, it's two editions already. The, I think it's out of print still, if one wants to get it. He also put out drushes of his, um, even translating drushes, as we'll see, that were in, printed in German. He had them translated to Hebrew. And he, okay. Then there's a small essay from Professor Schneider Zaman Lyman. And, and then in 1972, which is bef- um, a collection of articles and materials came out of the Archoner that were published originally in the journal Hamayan. And it was put into one nice booklet, in 1972. So these were the items that helped me, the 80-page booklet, these are some of the items that helped me for this presentation. Okay. Okay, looking forward to hearing about all that. So why don't you start from where he was born, who did he learn by, who were some of his Talmidim, I'm sure some of his Rabbeim, some of his Talmidim, many of us heard about. So uh, fill us in. Okay, so um, because as the course of looking through um, his his life, and he was prolific. And it's actually frightening to see how much someone could do, produce, and be involved with in so many different areas, writing, and act, being actively involved in the tzibur. Um, it's it's mind boggling. This is a year. He's born in seven in seventeen ninety eight. He dies in eighteen seventy one. And I, as I just look and trying to put in, I don't know how someone today how someone could have could do such a thing. And this is. He's doing this without computers, without all the technologies that we have. Now, 
Um, and we'll see what I mean. And therefore, to say at the outset is I'm not attempting by any stretch of the imagination to cover everything that relates with this person. It, it's just unbelievable amounts of material, as I quoted earlier. Okay. So first is his main, his first, I guess his first Rebbe is his father. He quotes him in his writings. But then his main Rebbe, his, one of his main, he has his two, pe- are two different people. One is the Shargis Aryeh's son. This is Rav Asher Wals- Wallerstein, who is a big Talmud of his father, Shargis Aryeh, and and Darchuner, Rav Yaakov Etlinger, learns by him for a long time. He's a great person, this, this Rav, who had hundreds of Talmudim, but virtually nothing of his was printed. Now, once I saw this, a question that I had uh, about Darchuner was easily answered. I was, I was very... I found it interesting that here we have a Yakasha Gadol. Um, he's born in Germany, and we're not going to get into all the nitty gritty of where he's born and who his wife is and all these fascinating pieces of information just to get um, cover some ground. It basically, is like this: in the Litvish, even in the Litvish world, the elite Litvish world, Archlaner, this Yakasha Sefer is extremely accepted in, in the Lamdish Yeshivish world. Let's say for Yavamis even, and um, people that learn Kachim. We'll get to about Krisus, and his Chuvas are also very, very highly respected. So what's Pshat? And this was the answer, because he learned by this person, who today, if I ask, most people never even heard of him, Rav Asher Wallerstein, but he was a Talmud Muvak of his father, the Shagasari. Once you have that, that's the key to everything. Because the Shagasari, who had, had tremendous, tremendous impact and respect in the, in the, in the Litvish world for, for hundreds of years, some of this we've discussed in previous episodes in different Masechtas, so let's say Tainus, we discussed a little bit about it in other places. So this was a, this is clearly part of the answer, because his Mahalach Halimud is linked to the Shargis Arye, because his, his Rebbe was a Talmud by his father. Anyway, um, and I see also, so later on, that Bleich, she also makes this connection. That's one Rebbe of his. Another Rebbe of his was Rabbi Rambin. Rabbi Rambin links us to the Hafla and Rav Nassim Adler. They, they were his Rebbe. This would, this would obviously give us an explanation why his Psakim became so accepted. Um, his Psakalacha is so... It, this is coming from the same people that are into the, the Chsam Seifer. Rabbi was a very close friend of the Chsam Seifer. Talmid, they're both Talmidim and Dafla, also of Nafs and Adler. Anyway, the kids are this Rav being he had a big yeshiva. He also had a tremendous a, a impact on Yudin in Germany. He, he was a tremendous Dayan. Lots and lots of interesting stuff about him, but not for now. Um, but this Horowitz has a special article out of Rav in his base medrash. Now, some people say that if you look through Reb, the Archoner stuff, you'll see that he, oh, there's even an influence of Kabbalah. So they say that it comes from, um, I think Bleich says this, maybe some others, that it comes from this Reb of Rambing, who also was into Kabbalah, we, uh, Haflo was into Kabbalah, and definitely Reb Nassan Al was into Kabbalah. And we see in certain chuvas of his, even in Halacha, he shows a Bikiyas in Zaya. We do not have too much material from Rabbi Ram Bing, say for Zichron Avram, which is some notes of his on Shulchan Arach, and in some of his chuvas, Darchlaner brings materials and discussions he had with Rabbi Ram Bing, but it's interesting as it's false. The two Rabbeim, who were in their times, tremendous Rosh Hashiva, Paiskim, had hundreds of Talmidim of Darchlaner, Rabbi Ram Bing, and Rabbi Asher Wallerstein. Virtually no one knows of these names today, especially now Rabbi Asher Wallerstein, uh, Wallerstein. And not only that, they were active, they were involved with everything going on, but None of their come out, none of their tire was published. Where their Talmud, who Arayim, he's he's famous, he's constantly quoted, and his materials are constantly being printed. Even this week or, or last week, another vo- reprint of a fancy edition of one of his volumes on Archlaner just came out from Mahon Yushalai. But Kitzer, bottom line is that this Talmud, this this Archlaner, somehow I don't know what this chus was that he's tremendously, tremendously famous in the in the world at large, not only in Germany. Okay. Anyway, what's very famous about him is. Um, some people like to quote it, is he went to university for three years. He did not complete his degree. He left for whatever reasons. We're not sure. But over there, he already meets and becomes close with another unique guy, Rabbi Isaac Bernays. This person was also a tremendous guy. Um, um, Schneer Zaman Lyman has um, a nice amount of the best collection of material about him in a small essay. In a, in, it's not so small, but in a very, power, a very excellent essay called Rabbinic Responses to Modernity. And he collected the information about um, this Chacham Bernays, who was also a Chacham of in Würzburg, and also a Tremendous Tamil Chacham. Now, he writes that when they learned, they, the two of them were in university together, learning by Rav Rambing, and, um, and, and they used to say that when they were learning, Mechavrusa Marnavuchim, Bernays was the, was the person that was leading the Chavrusa Shaf. And when it was the Gei Shulchan Aruch Yeridei, the Archel was. But both of them were tremendous Tamil Chacham in all areas of Taira. 
Both of them were tremendous Tamil Chacham in all areas of Torah. Now, um, some people claim that the that the Archoner had charata for going to university. He wanted to do tshuva for his whole life about it. Um, at Kach, I saw that Horowitz brings down and he prints from a some copy of Rabbi Kiva Yosef Schlesinger's Sefer Base Yosef Chadash, which is a fascinating Sefer in its own right, a passage where he says something of the effect that um, about uh, in a hespit about the Archoner, someone said that he he um, sounds like he didn't want to go. He he was he fasted forty days that he shouldn't get damaged from it, etc. A whole interesting piece about it. But there's a hespid that 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 um, was given by some of the new Larchlaner printed. It was printed in one of the newspapers at the time, and it says it basically says that uh, why did he go to learn to be able to be able to answer mas, um, apikarsim and to to know um, st- stuff like that. But while he was just a few hours during the the whole time that he was there, he was Isaac in it. He was in university just for a few short hours during the week. Okay, but whatever it is, um, he becomes this um, Chacham Bernays. He becomes he remains close with him his whole life. He even gives a hespit on him, which was printed and he wrote it was said in German and it was printed from the German into in, into Hebrew a few times. Now, what's fascinating is that both the Archoner and Rabbi Bernays they have two same Talmidim. Rav Hirsch, Rav Shamshin, known as Rav Shamshin Fel Hirsch, and Rav Azriel Hilzenheimer. Now, both these Talmidim, they took things from both these Rabbeim. And um, in, in Lamashal, the, um, in this, the journal of Amayan, they have an old article from Mordechai Breuer, they talk about what Rav Hirsch took out from the Arch Lener. He learned by him where in his er, the Arch Lener in his early career, his, his career began at the young age of 27, where he had a, he had a close in Mannheim, where, which was very incre- it's incredible for such a young age to have a hundred, um, uh, maybe uh, 70 Talmidim, 100 Talmidim. One of those is Rav Hirsch. He learned by him for one year. And Breuer has a whole article discussing um, Rav Hirsch and, and this learning in this yeshiva from different letters that he put together. But the point is that um, it seems that he had a tremendous impact on Rav Shamsher for the rest of his life. Um, um, there's an article which collects the various times that he quotes, where Rav Shamsher for Hirsch quotes his Rebbe in his Torah. Anyway, the Kitzer, he has uh, um, um, this the Archonera's impact on Shamsha Falersh, and also, and others say much more, um, this, this Chacham Bernays, but they both, they, they, they both had impact on, on, on Rav Shamsha Falersh, and the same with Rav Israel Hildesheim. Anyway, the kids are, this is, there's a, a, um, a lot to talk about, uh, um, about this practice, because, base, base, and eventually what happens is, is that the, he ends up becoming Rav of Altuna in 1836. That's where he again opens up a big yeshiva. Rabbi Israel Hildesheim learns by him there, and that also we'll see we'll we'll see um, possibly a little bit later on the impact that Rabbi Israel Hildesheimer that got Kenire from his Rebbe the Archoner, and also from Bernays is not for now, but uh, with Archoner we'll come back to shortly. Kalana, this is some of his, these are two of the most. What I'm trying to say is, sorry for being unclear, is that these are two of the great Talmidim, of the two of the many hun, dozens and dozens of Talmidim that learned by Larach Lener that became very famous people, the leaders of the German Jewry, the next generation. They also were um, were Talmidim of his good friend that he was friends with already from when he learned in yeshiva and kept up with him his whole life. Another Chashav Rav, um, Rabbi Bernays. Okay, I can. Um, this is just some of the early history and his Talmidim. Okay. Fascinating. Very interesting. So as you said, some names we heard of, some names many people, including myself, have not heard of. Um, fine. So what did he write? Most of us are probably aware he wrote the Arachoner. Most of us are probably aware he wrote the Shuvah's Ben Yitzin. What can you tell us about those Svarim? And what else do you want to bring to the table? Okay. So I'm just going to go very briefly like this. He writes, the first Sefer that he publishes is Bikuri Yaakov in 1836, but we'll return to that shortly. He, the Sefer that he prints, one of his early Sfarim that he prints, um, not at a, he's not a youngster anymore at this point, but in 1850, he prints his work on Yavamis. Okay. Now, the work on Yavamis, when you open it up right away, in the Shar, there's an emphasis about the Sefer. And it says that it's not only, it's about Gemara, Rashi, Taisis, Kol Daf, Adaf, 
He's trying not to, he talks about halachis and agadis. He tries to invite the Rishayim, the Achreinim, everything that could possibly be in Masech the Sivamas, he's going to talk about. So it's Bekitzer, a very, very thorough Sefer, and that's perhaps why it became one of the classics from Yavamas, very, very Pshat oriented, and it deals with literally everything. Now, in the Hagdama already, he mentions a certain point, and this point he hazards over in a few other places. Basically, he saw. Why does he pick Yavamas? So first of all, that's already something, showing something unique about him, because Yavamas is, as we discussed, the Haris Masechta and Seder Nashim. Well, I would, it's funny that he should pick the Haris Masechta. Why don't you write about an easier Masechta? Not that they're all so easy, but they're easier than Yavamas. Anyway, he says, Gufa, because there are not other, there are other Masechtas have Purushim and Achrein. Yavamas, he didn't see someone going through from beginning to end. So that's why he felt to do it. Especially, is that Pnei Yeshu was planning, it seems, to write on Yavamas, and he didn't. So therefore, he held, had this extra push to do it. Now, in general, he has this theme, um, where is that he go, goes out of his way to defend Rashi. And um, and he says this in various Hagdamas of his Svarim, that one of his goals is to defend Rashi from the various Shilas that the Rishayim bring up. Okay. Later on, in 1855, he publishes Amakis and Krisus. Again, what's shot that he picks these two Masechtas? So he he writes about it in the um, his Agdama Baruch Hashem, um, in, like I mentioned in the past. It's I always when an author writes a Hagdama, a lot of times they shed light on what they wrote and stuff like that. Here he um, he talks about it also why he picks these Masechtas, even though um, especially Krisus, it's not Nagei Alach Lamaisa, but he says no, it's a it's a Chelik of Taira. And it's a mistake, and you should you have to learn very carefully. And it's important to learn a beer. And, he, and this, because there's no sp- specific beer, he's going to write a beer on the whole Masechta. That's on Krisus. The so same thing, Makas. He says the only Pirish there is is the Ritva from the Rishainim. And there's even a Chreinim that there are. It's not thorough through all things. So he's going to write a thorough Pirish on these Masechtas, Krisus, and Makas. So basically, what he's doing is he was looking, he was scouting out in each Seder a Masechta to write about. And that's what he picks. So from Nashim, he picks Yvamis. Then he does uh, Makis, and then in Kachim he does Krisis. He also does Nida. In 1864, he prints his Chibra Nida. There he adds an um, um, interesting thing. It's a very important Masechta. Rabbanim did learn Nida because it's very Halach Lamaisa oriented, but they don't learn Mamish everything. The whole Masechta be out of sight. So again, he went through the whole Masechta, Klar, every aspect about the Masechta. So it's also Halach de Kachibur. He's focusing on Halach, which I already mentioned in the Yavamas. He says such a thing, but he, even in the other Masechtas. Now, another point that he throws in by Nida, Nagdama, is that he deals with sometimes the Nusach and the Gemara. Okay. Which we'll get back to soon. Now, I, I mentioned that his first sefer is called Bikure Yaakov. This is published in 1836. What's this on? This is on Hilchus Dalid Minim and Hilchus Sukkah. An intense Be'iyundika sefer written on these halachas. An incredible sefer. It's very well known. The Mishnah Brewer uses it um, numerous times, sometimes not attributing the name um, that it's from the Bikure Yaakov, other times Many times, yes, but the point is that it's 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 a classic out of yoyim. Anyone knows that when you learn Hilcha Sukkah or Dalaminim, this is the the address to turn to. One of the first addresses of the Gedolei Apaiskim. Now, the Sefer is as it, it, as I said earlier, he deals with even Kabbalah, but he you could see him looking up every Magen Avram, every source of a Magen Avram, every single thing. It, it, it's an incredible Sefer, very beam. Now that he wrote in 1836 when he's when he's relative, relatively more young. But he got a lot of letters over the years, and he publishes those letters in a second edition, which comes out in 1858. And not only that, he puts out, at the same time now, a thorough safer on the whole Masechta of Sukkah, similar to his style, which he developed over the years, which was how he learned the Sugyas from scratch. He he's goes through everything, Rashi Taisis, the Rishayim that he had. He's focusing on the on the Nusach of the Gemara, everything, every, Mamish, everything. One of these most one of the most thorough svarim on whichever Masechti he writes about. So he does this for Sukkah, and this is in 1858 with uh, Yisafas. So, Lamashal, Rabbi Kiva Eger, wrote Ha'ara Soif Yamov on the Bikur Yaakov. These are published there. It seems Rabbi Kiva Eger was going to write more Ha'aris, but um, they they were um, I, he died before he was planning on before he was able to publish the rest. Anyway, Bikitzer, um, so first, 
so the, so he so that's those, those are some factors with the Masech the Sukkah the, that he first did the Halacha Lamaisa. I mean, say his first sefer was a Halacha Duka sefer, and then he goes to start being um, dealing with the Mefarshim on the Masech uh, to deal with the actual Masech. And then with Sukkah, eventually he comes back to Sukkah and he does it. Now he was Zaycha because many Mechaber are not Zaycha to print this farm in their lifetime. Here he prints the sefer in his lifetime. He gets a lots of feedback. We have tons of letters that he got from all different Gedolim. So he deals with them. He responds to them in his next edition, but he does even more than that. He even reprints, he even writes a whole sefer on the whole Masech Sukkah, which is not a small Masech and it's a very thorough sefer. Anyway, one of the early interesting bibliographical things is this is one of the first people that deals with, with the Maisa Rav. The Maisa Rav was printed in the early 1830s. So the 1836, we have in Germany already someone dealing a few times with the Hanhagas of the Gra. This is the Bakuri Yaakov has such pieces. Elsewhere in his other Chuvas, he also is concerned with, with pieces of the Gra. And anyway, um, 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 th- those are some sh- uh, short uh, pieces about the Chibaran Tzoko. Now, he dies in, we said he dies in 1871. But we have two other Masechtas that are published shortly after he dies. One is on Masech the Sanhedrin. Now, Sanhedrin, it turns out, when was when did he, he writes this, he, his son writes this, or he writes it somewhere, that in 1821 he began working on this, which is, that means is he's, 20, he's, he's, a, he's in his low 20s when he's writing a, a parish on Sanhedrin. We have the whole parish on Sanhedrin, again, when um, it's Mamish, a similar style, thorough, thorough, thorough. He finishes in 1824, but his whole life he kept on adding to it, and his son prints it in 1873. At the same time, in 1873, he prints Rosh Hashanah. Basically, he started looking around, which, say, this is now, Rosh Hashanah, interestingly enough, is not like Sanhedrin, which was he printed when he was in his low 20s. This he's printing Saif Yama when he's in his 70s. He's, he's working on it in his late 60s and 70s. Basically, it seems like he was looking for, you know, this, as we'll see, how prolific he was. Not only he's writing all these Gurum and Shas, he's Chuvis, and we'll get to more stuff, but basically, he's looking for another area to write about. So he decides to write about Rosh Hashanah. We already, um, it seems because Rosh Hashanah is attractive to him because it has Nisim and Zraim, Kachim, Tyrus. This is something we discussed that some people, I quoted from Reb Zevin when he was writing a book review about the truest Melech on, on Masechtus Rosh Hashanah, that Rosh Hashanah is like, even though it's not Suvis, which is a, famous for being called a Shas Katan, but so too Rosh Hashanah has so many multiple sugyas from all over. So it's a similar thing. And that was what attracted Aruch Lamer to write his Chibur on, um, on Masechtus Rosh Hashanah. And it's printed again in 1873 by the Sun. Now, it seems there was a work on Psachim, but it's lost. It could be there were other Masechtas that he wrote about. We don't know anything about it. Now, just to be Messiah with one um, other Prat, I, I mentioned that he says in Hagdama that he he um, he's very into Rashi. Okay? So he's very into Rashi. So he says it's a very well-known thing. People are always very nice. And there's a lot of times we find steers in Rashi from one Masechta to another. So interestingly enough, he, he deals with this. And it seems in a bunch of places, I... He says the following Masai that there's no it's not a steer Rashi. Rashi is Mafarish in, in Masechta light the way he heard from his Rebbe that he learned by this Masechta. And a different Masechta will explain it based on Rashi, how he learned it from a different Rebbe in different Masechta. Now, this is not so clear um, how this works based on what we know more today about Rashi and even what he did learn. We do know that he got a lot from different Rebbeim, but Akabanim, this is a Yisoyed that Archoner uses in different places. Okay. Now, um, okay, Ad Khan, his Chibar Archoner, um, and some aspects of, 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 of the dating and side aspects relating to the Chibar. Okay. So you covered the well known Svarim. What are some of the other places where he had writings? Okay, so, so this leads us, we'll, 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 we'll present it in the following manner. What made one of the things that made him unique was besides that he was writing on chess, and is that he was behind a journal that came out in those years. Okay, what am I referring to? There's a journal, it was called Shaymer Tzioin Hanemon. Okay, now Shaymer Tzioin Hanemon, um, um, for this, I'm going to use two, I'm going to use the actual journal, the, the pieces that I went through. What I'm going to start with is again, um, Rebetz and Bleich in her doctorate, but later on she wrote an article based on this, and it was incorporated in her recent book called Defenders of the Faith, highly recommended. Here's how it looks. And in here is a whole chapter talking about the, the, this, this Shoymer Tzia Neman, and we'll see why what's so significant about this Kaivitz. Basically, we t- um, she talks about this also. Um, 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 I've written a little bit about it also. The Hashivas of newspapers in general in, in 
Today, not as much because we have the internet, but pre-internet days, which some of us can still even remember, this is the way people got information, especially in Europe. People used to look forward to the newspapers and um, to read everything what's going on. This is how you, this was your connection to finding out what's, what's going on in the world. Now, not all, it, um, there's, there were dozens and dozens of different newspapers that used to come out just to bring out a certain point. Today, you, there's not even whole collections of many newspapers that were very popular in the time. And the reason is because so many, not only was it because they, sometimes they're printed on cheaper paper, but also because when sometimes if a guy had a subscription in a town, everyone in the town would cheer it. And by the time it was finished, it, it, it looked, it was useless. Anyway, but this just that's just a tidbit. But the point is that, but there was not only newspapers, there was also journals. And today we today there's unbelievable amounts of journals that are coming out, still out of young, printed, not printed. Um, but what happens is this is a way for people to discuss Tyra or hot issues of the day. So they fa- so one of the first such journals that came out was was he Darchaner and others were involved with, um, and basically it came out for a period of on and off of close to ten years. It was it had two parts actually. There was and sometimes it came out weekly. Some the, I'm not going to get into all the details. When it, sometimes it came out weekly, sometimes not. But over a period of ten years. Part came out in German, in the German language, which is a, which is a very important Chiddush. So, but I cannot. I don't read German, so I don't know anything what's going on in those in those in those um, newspapers. She Rebbe Black talks a lot about it. Has fascinating things. It sounds like it's a shame that some of the materials are not translated. Happens to be that this person Yehuda Horowitz he translated some essays from um, and drushes that were found over there. But I could focus on the Hebrew part, and the Hebrew part. Um, there's, it's, it's an, when you open it up, it's, it's a simply an incredible, an incredible um, journal, and you'll find all types of material. There'll be regular Torah from people, submissions from all different gedolim, even the Maram Shikla Mashal. You'll find a piece of Torah from the Maram Shikla, all different people, and the Torah could be about all different types of things. <coughs> it could be regular Torah about a Gemara. It could be about a God to Gemaras. It could be someone just thought of a question, and then the next issue, someone will handle a possible answer, and through, there will be a, if someone has a problem with a certain halacha, he'll raise it, and it's unbelievable when you when you go through the table of contents index what's going on in this journal. Now, what's significant is people chashiv very chashiv, who's who of that period of time would be some, would s- submit in different materials, and one of the writers that wrote a ton in this was obviously who. The Arachlaner himself. He was the editor with some with someone else, and they were responsible for a lot of the stuff. And a lot of hot topics, fights, controversies even took place in the paper in this paper. Now, um, just to get just to understand, um, sometimes there'll be um, um, just to give an example, the Matzitza controversy, which I'm going to hopefully talk about shortly, um, which which happened a bunch of times. Another tshuva, which we'll discuss also a little bit about, about Kaddish Yasim, about saying Kaddish Yasim, where these, the start of this will be someone submitted an article about a topic, and then sometimes the Archon himself will respond, and they took place in these, in these, um, in the, in the pages of this over a period of 10 years. Literally incredible. Now, what's, what's even, now, those tshuvas that the Archon wrote in the course of the, of this, of this of these ten years and many other chuvas eventually incorporates into a chuva sefer of his called Binyan Sian, which is printed Saif Yam of eighteen sixty eight, and there were other chuvas of his that his son prints in eighteen seventy eight. Okay, now I mentioned the outset this is a review of the Harwitz, He printed this edition, so he he does an incredible job. First, he shows where if let's say it was printed in the chi- originally in the Shemer Tzion Hanemon. He'll show you where it is. If G'day Le'achreinim handle the chuva, he brings it down. He has manuscript information about it. He'll put it in. And it's simply, he did an incredible job. Uh, to give a taste of some chuvas, I'm going to come back to shortly, but I first wanted to focus on something else that I see as you turn the pages of the Shemer Tzian Neman. And that is the usage. This is a Haredi Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox journal that's coming out for 10 years. And, and I don't know the number of people that got it, but it definitely tons of Rabbanim all over Europe were, received, were receiving this. What you see in here is, besides for all the chuvas and the tyrus that are being discussed, there's also manuscripts are being printed. Tons of manuscripts. Manuscripts of Rishayinim. Manuscripts of Ga'inim. There, each issue could be like four or five pages, and there could be a piece of Tyra on a Gemara. And I got it to Gemara someone else. There's a, some halacha controversy about something else. Then someone will put in a manuscript that they just found in a, in a library, this and this piece of a Ga'in. And sometimes they'll have a Horus. 
and this is all under who the the the, the chief editor is Darach Lemer. He was very, Bikitzer, What we see from here is that this was a period of time that manuscripts were being discovered in the various libraries, and they were being published here in this in this journal. Even stuff from Yushalayim was being sent in to here to be published from that were found in libraries and manuscripts there. Anyway. Um, in general, Darach Lener was very into this topic. Just to say briefly, we find him in 1856, uh, some Ga'inan materials came out. We find him giving Ha'aris and Askama to this material. In in one of the Chuvas in the, in the that Horowitz printed, he collected from somewhere else, we have Ha'aris of his on the Ravon. Now, similarly, the Dikduke Seifrim, who is a fascinating person who deserves um, a, a lot of the attention, but we won't talk about him now. He made, basically had a project where he collected the various manuscripts on the Gemara. So he needed Haskamas from different Gedolim. One of the Gedolim that endorsed him was, again, the Archlener. And as I said, in Sechtas Nida, he writes, the Archlener himself writes, that he's very Isaac in the in the Lashayness of the Gemara and stuff like that. He had a son-in-law who was a great Rav, a Rav Freiman, who was a Rav and who had a tremendous... Um, Kesher with him, with our, I mean with Arch Lener, and in Halacha and different things, because he was a Rav also, and, and he also worked on printing a work from Ga'inim called Sefer Vahizir, and he puts it out, it's available on Hebrew books, with extensive um, footnotes to be to be mefarish, the different pieces of this this early work, possibly Ga'onic work. Now, um, even in Chuvas of his, we see him accepting Rav Moshe Bleich. This is a son of Rabbi Bleich, and also a son of Rabbi Judith, of Rabbi and Judith Bleich, who we've been quoting throughout this thing. He quotes to showing him using new Chuvas. Now, all this, Mir Tzashem, actually, I hope in season to just to give a spoiler over here in season two of Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky, we hope to deal with this at much greater length. But I'm just focusing on Darach Lener and his journal over here, Shem Etzion Nemon. You see the whole time. This is a journal that's being read all over Europe. Gedalim, even Maram Shik is writing in here, all different types. So who's who of Gedalim of that time? And every issue has, almost every issue has Kisveyad and different things. Okay, now, so you see, it wasn't so. Um, it, it was looked. It was. It was looked. It was okay, so to speak. Okay. Now, more importantly, I mentioned that who's one of the big Talmidim or the biggest Talmuds, according to some, of the Aruchanet, Rabbi Israel Hildzenheim, who ends up founding the Berlin Seminary. This is what their Isaac and manuscripts, all this, which is its own big parsha. But anyway, you could see here when you look at the Shemetzi and Neman, and you see the gish, the approach of the Aruchanet, it's not schwer. So it's easy to understand the connection between Rabbi Israel Hildzenheim and how come he looked at his, that the Aruchanet was his great rabbi. Anyway. Um, this is just some of the um, materials that we see in the Shemit Tzionem. And what relates to us over here is, is that it also had halachas, the, the um, conversations and controversies. So I, I just want to mention two, because if you, um, it's impossible. Every truva of the Binyan Tzion is unbelievable. Literally, it, the way he writes with clarity and how he goes through the whole sugya. Some of them are short and sweet. You could, you could like a lot of Chubas Farm are also, they're goldmine for historians, for people that are into halacha. Anyway, Eiladavar Saif, the, the time is short and we have to move on. But I, but um, as I say, you can't, you can't, I can't say nothing about it. So just to mention, very briefly, one is there was a controversy about doing Matzitza Bepeh. This controversy keeps on getting revived in recent years and um, for various different things about it. And one of the times early on that this controversy was, was went on in the Arch, with Archoner. And he, and it's, Part of the uh, discussions took place again in the Shemer Tzion Nemon. In the Shemer Tzion Hanemon, sorry. Now, just to quote, uh, if I could find it, one second. So there's a, so the Tshuva, which he talks about, Metzitza, he has a few Tshuvas that were eventually put into Ben Yitzin. I'm not going to go into if there's Shinoyim and the differences and whatever, but just to quote, Basically, they wanted to, um, I, I think some people started, there, there were deaths, and they wanted to say that you shouldn't do it pair. So, the Archoner has a few truths about this, and as I said, there were others, it seems even in the German part, which I can't read, um, there were also truths in the newspapers of the Archoner about it. Now, so in the truths Binyan Tzien, I'm just going to quote it from here, he talks all about it, he goes through the whole sugya, he deals with, the, with whatever the doctors say, and then he says, he concludes... Um, as follows, this is a minute that was going on for hundreds of years. Um, he says, We do not change because of doctors. 
basically to do it, you should do dafka bepek. He said ikra mitzitza like he showed in this simon in in this is simon chav gimel in shuvas ben yitzin. And again in simon chav dalad he also deals with it more. Now. He's, and just to conclude over here, he says, um, even though there is a sakana, if the, if let's um, you should be very careful if something if let's say something f- is found out about, about a certain mile or something, you should act accordingly. But the point is that he says we we understand that the doctors what the doctors say. Now, obviously, the sugya of the matzitza is is endless. It is say there articles being written about it. It would be not fair for me to mention my good friend. Was Nifter sadly a few years ago? Dr. Sprecher wrote a beautiful article about it, and there are many other in the Hakira, easily found online. I could send a PDF if someone wants, but there's so much, so much written about it. I, I am not even attempting to talk about it. I have no opinion about it. It's not my place to even think about talking about it. This is Dvarm Shem the Beruma Shalaylam. But here you see the Archlaner, his approach was that we go according to Chazal, even, and this is a person that was an educated person, even though um, he went to university, and we see from him that he was, uh, I guess you, to use the words, open-minded, and not only that, his great Talmud, Rav Shem Shafal Hirsch, and a tshuva printed by Rav Kalman Kahana, also has a tshuva about abolishing, um, about abolishing Metzitza, um, to do not, to, not to do Metzitza. He also says, basically, he sends you to his um, his Rebbe, and he goes with him also, and he knows about the medical stuff, and he also goes with this approach. I just feel that we have to mention one um, hot example, and then just to quote two last two chuvas, and then we'll um, come to close to come out a conclusion. Is there's a whole arichos about the sugi of Kadesh Yasim? Today we know Kadesh Yasim. Saying Kaddish causes, um, if everyone says it, or you, where do you say it? Um, anyway, but it seems that the original meaning, whatever it was, was one person would say it. Even if there were a bunch of Avelim in a shul, only one person would say it. Now, how do we know that this is true? Very simple. You open up the halachas, let's say the Magan Avram, and you'll see a richos nifla based on earlier paiskim of who get who who gets the din of who's supposed to say it. If someone has yard site, what what's the what who who has chus kedima of saying kadosh yasim? And this is a big discussion in paiskim. At a certain point in time, it switched. Why It's beyond the scope now? But it seems someone wrote a letter into again to the shaymer tzina neman a rav at the time, and it seems in his kihila there were fights. He said even someone slapped someone in the face about it. It was a whole thing. So he was trying to come up with a pesa kula, and the kula would be that everyone would say. Together, anyway, the Archlaner, it's a fascinating chuva. The Archlaner has a whole chuva about it, um, which originally was printed in the in the journal, and then eventually it's included in his writings. I just like to conclude with one last chuva, just because I, I feel um, it has to. It's just uh, it should be mentioned again, not the whole story, but basically in Simon Kufnun Dalad, I think it became somewhat famous. Is basically um, in those days it was common. Men would have to travel for Parnassa, and they would be away for months at a time. The kids are, um, this woman, her husband's away traveling, and some poor guy comes to the house. He looks like he's, um, you know, uh, I guess he looks like he's. Uh, she was impressed by him, and she sees he's a parush, and he's not eating anything, and she's doing chesed, and he's living there um, for a while. She's doing chesed with him. It seems like there was other people in the house. It was, it was, uh, anyway, he um, he's doing all types of sigufim, and eventually, and she sees that chatzais, he would say, taking chatzais, and all different types of things. Um, anyway, at one point, he he tells her, you want to know who I am? I'm Elio Hanavi, and, you could, and he gives a whole... The whole, there's a whole fascinating story. It seems this, and, and in the end, he convinces her. And Vamei uh, Yavin, what ends up happening, and it happens not once, or twice, three times. And it's a whole fascinating tshuva about this and the whole story. It seems it wasn't only a tshuva written to Larach Lener, other Rabbanim also that Harwitz points out. But the point is, it's just very interesting. You know, someone fell for an Elia Navi type um, um, story. Anyway, okay, I can. I'm, I'm not joking. I feel terrible. I feel pushed guilty that I'm not doing him justice, but he was in just an incredible place, like hundreds of chuvas, which could be found. Anyone would just sit down one day and, you, and just even to look at the table of contents of what the Shilas are about, it, it's mind boggling. Okay, just to finish very fast, he's a, he's an c- incredible darshan. He gave drushes in German. Some of those drushes were printed after he dies in a safer called Minchas Ani. It's still even available today. There's nice editions of it. Um, that was printed in Hebrew, but there were many drushes that were printed in this back to this journal in German. 
So this Horowitz printed a book, a sefer called, um, this is how it looks, it's called Menu, uh, Mincha Rucha, it looks like this. This is, he got someone to translate various drushes of his that were written in German. Anyway, um, at, at some point in time, uh, 30, 40 years ago, a Haggadah Shal Pesach material of his comes out, and every once in a while some more materials of his comes out. Akopadim, this is just a, a small, small amount of information about this great Gadol that is famous out of Yom, as opposed to, as I said, his Rabbeim. He played a role in, in the Torah world, of, of in the Yeshiva world, in his Chedusha Manshas, and Halacha world, with his Bikur Yaakov, and those in the Hilchasuk of Dalaminim, and his Chuvah is incredible. I feel I'm not doing justice, but at least we, I think I gave some insight into a little bit about um, about this great guy. Wonderful, really, really wonderful. Thank you very much. I know that there's so much more to say. Just a one nakuda with the mitzitzah bepe. Um, the listeners could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in Washington Heights, I remember hearing from a well-known moil um, in Washington Heights that they do not do mitzitzah bepe. Mm-hmm. Okay. Even though you mentioned, you seem to be saying that Rabbi Shamsher Paul Hirsch and Reb and the Aruch Liner came out. What was their maskana? Sounds like their maskana again. They the 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 point was there was an attempt to abolish it. So it could be there was different, um, like everything. There's different aspects to the to the Dion. The, the whole controversy has different aspects. Everyone knows there's a famous Chassam cipher which seemed to be made on certain situations. Of course, like everything else, that the Chassam cipher didn't write it. Did he write it? We know that he really did. Anyway, but so there's different phases and there were different times it seems that they held, if it doesn't have to be Bepe, at least it could be done Bekli, not to abolish a Legamri, and that a lot of people do do that um, with a Kli, but again, maybe Masech Shabbos down the line, we could discuss all about the, the controversies of Matzitza and all that, uh, but not for now.